Welcome back to Jerusalem Minute. Josh Haston here, correspondent for JNS. I am here with the CEO of JNS, Alex Trayman. We are in Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Alex, how are you? Well, we're doing well. The news is moving very, very quickly right now. It's, it's hard to keep up, but you know we got a great staff and we're doing, we're doing what we need to do. Yeah, we were talking off air. You said that this could actually be like a two or three hour podcast with so much going on in the news, but we'll try not to make it that long. Um, but here we are now, six months exactly this week, six months since the beginning of the war, of course, preempted by the horrible Hamas massacre on Simchat Torah on October the 7th. Where do we stand? If you look at it, just taking a step back six months later. Well, first of all, Prime Minister Netanyahu said at the very beginning that this is not going to be a war that takes days or weeks. This is a war that's going to take months. They even made preparations for a war that could take up to a year. Um, when Israel started the war, they moved very quickly, you know, through northern Gaza Strip. Um, they pushed the civilians out of the north, and they were able to capture the north very quickly, almost like a third of the strip within just a few weeks. And then they went through Central Strip, and now in the south, they have a situation which perhaps they didn't prepare for in the beginning, where you'd have over a million people hold up in this one area of Rafah. And I think with any major project, you don't, you don't make— you make very fast proge- progress in the beginning, and then when you get to the end, you don't realize you know, how much detailed work needs to be done in order to finish. Um, I think militarily it's been a success you know, so far. I, I, the, the IDF has really proven itself. The, the valiant effort of the soldiers, the bravery has really proven itself. I, it, there's been casualties, absolutely, both deaths and injuries that have been horrific. People don't even really talk about how many injuries there have been, but there's been a lot. But even so, when you consider what what they had to deal with inside Gaza, it's it's been pretty efficient and effective. Uh, but then, of course, is the whole diplomatic story. And we've seen from the very beginning how nations of the free world all came to support Israel, led by the United States. And certainly, as the war progresses, uh, Israel's been losing ground on the diplomatic front. Yeah, and that's exactly what Hamas wanted to happen when they came in October 7th. They knew Israel must retaliate. And, of course, they put their civilians in harm's way, knowing Israel would strike. And then the media goes ahead and uh, blames Israel, and the world community turns on Israel. That was all expected. The prime minister, however, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, very optimistic and upbeat and promising that Israel is going to continue this war. We're going to go full force into Rafah. He said, no force in the world will stop us after what Hamas has done. And on Monday, he actually said the op, uh, the operation in Rafah would proceed, saying he has a date for the military offensive. And let's go to the video on that. So there you have the prime minister saying, we have a date. And now the defense minister, Yoav Gallen, actually said uh, to one of his counterparts, I believe, in the UK, he said, no, we don't have a date. So a little bit of a discrepancy there between the remarks of the prime minister and the defense minister, both of them saying, yes, we are going to go forward. But in terms of actually pinpointing a date, seems to be some uh, disagreement there between the two top officials here in yeah, Israel. I, I don't think that there is necessarily a specific date that they have in mind. Maybe there's a goal, you know, how long they think it will take before they can do it. Uh, Certainly, it's going to take weeks before that happens. Uh, You know, Israel wants to move as much of that civilian population that is currently in Rafah into another safe area, which would be uh, several kilometers north of there, and to also set up all the humanitarian provisions that may be required, including tents. I just saw a report this week that Israel has ordered over 40,000 tents, um, and I assume that they're going to want to bring even more tents over there. They're going to have to move people, move tents, and make sure that uh, food and other humanitarian items can get in. So that's a tremendous logistics operation that Israel didn't plan for in the beginning of the war. Uh, they're not going to go into Rafah until that has been set up, until that set up has been communicated and approved by the United States and until the population has been moved. So we're probably weeks away. And uh, I, I don't know what, if they have an idea of exactly when the troops will go in there. As speaking of the troops this week, 
the IDF announced that the ground troops in southern Gaza, essentially most, if not all of the ground troops, I think one battalion left, but most of the ground troops pulled out of Khan Yunus and southern Gaza. And there was a question, basically, everyone was asking, why did they pull out? And you even had right wing ministers, so-called in the government, who lashed out at the prime minister, defense minister, causing perhaps a coalition crisis, saying that a pullout of troops from southern Gaza harms the war effort and the prime minister risks losing his mandate should the military fail to fully eliminate Hamas. So is this is this politics here? Why the pullout from Gaza now? I mean, they were saying, the idea was saying is these guys need a break. They've been in there for four months. They need a break, perhaps leading up to a Raf operation, but the right-wing ministers aren't buying it. They think something else is going on. Maybe the, uh, the Netanyahu uh, team is uh, weakening, perhaps, losing their resolve, even though the prime minister says they're going full force. What's going on here? I think there's a lot of things that are at play at the same time, um, and you have headlines all over the world. Israel's pulling out. Is the war over? Uh Right-wing ministers, as you said, you know, questioning why the prime minister would, would do that, why the IDF would, would take troops out. I think there's a few things that are happening here simultaneously. The first is that following the mistaken strike on the aid convoy uh, last week, um, that the United States has been saying very clearly that they expect changes uh, in the way that Israel deals with humanitarian aid. Uh, and that if they don't get, if they don't see changes, that they are going to change their policies. Now, what does it mean if the United States would change their policies? So things that uh, we could be talking about are, we know that there is a, a resolution being brought to the UN Security Council uh, in to consider Palestinian statehood. Uh, the United uh, the United States has typically in the past vetoed such uh, resolutions, and Israel wants the United States to veto a resolution. Uh, so that's a big lever that the United States has uh, over the state of Israel. Also, we we see that there could be a another resolution that would come before the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire. Israel would want the United States to uh, veto such a resolution as well. So. The U.S. has some levers over Israel, and also we'll talk about it probably a little bit later, but uh, there's been threats uh, from Iran uh, that there could be retaliations for for a strike that Israel did it in Syria, uh, and that the threats were, and there's a lot of chatter about this, that if, if there was not a ceasefire in a very short period of time, that you could have all-out regional war. So I think what the United States is putting a tremendous amount of pressure on Israel, both in terms of the diplomacy, also in terms of uh, trying to uh, prevent a, a larger war. And then the other component is I think that the United States is saying to Israel, are you really serious about bringing back the hostages? Uh, and the U.S. has taken a an more aggressive step in trying to negotiate a hostage release. And I think that they put pressure on Israel to try to create conditions for a release, which meant pulling back some of the troops to indicate that they were ready to have a negotiations showing that the, you know, basically I think the Israel is uh, giving in in the very short term to a lot of U.S. demands, um, but still maintaining that they will go into Rafah when they're ready. So, yeah, again, you know, U.S. President Biden demanding that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu improves the humani humanitarian situation in Gaza, saying if we don't see changes from their side, we'll have to make changes. And then you saw just several days later, uh, it was reported that U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says that Israel has made important commitments to boosting aid to Gaza. This, of course, for months now has been the focus of the Biden administration, so much focus on the uh, humanitarian situation. At the same time, you had reported uh, just several hours ago a an interview on Spanish language television called Univision. I believe it was recorded on April 3rd and I guess just now aired in which President Biden says that he thinks the Netanyahu government is making a mistake the way they're approaching this war. And let's go ahead and watch that video. I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to 
just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. So, again, what you see there, you have President Biden saying that he wants Israel to commit to a ceasefire uh, at, for, I guess, up to six weeks, eight weeks or whatnot in order to provide more of that humanitarian aid as we go forward. So, you know, it looks like the U.S. is, in fact, uh, even though they issued threats before, it looks like they are somewhat changing policy. I don't know if they actually said ceasefire up to this point, if they called for a concrete ceasefire up, up until now in, in this, uh, you know, Well, if you look at the, the if you look at the Univision interview, you know, uh, first of all, you know, you, if you look closely at, at Biden's hands, you see his card. I mean, the, it's there's complete paragraphs of, of talking points there uh, for everything. And, and it looked like he was having a hard time dealing with all the issues. Uh, but when he says that he wants, he's calling for Israel to call for a six to eight week ceasefire to allow food and medicine in, you know, what he didn't say is that that ceasefire would be in exchange for the return of hostages. Um, you know, it seems as though everybody's forgetting why this war started. Um, perhaps it's been a mistake of Israel in their own messaging. Uh, you know, I think that the state of Israel should have been saying repeatedly day after day for the last 180, 190 days, uh, you know, that this war can be over very fast. All it takes is for the hostages to be returned and for the senior leadership of Hamas to surrender. The second those two things happen, this war is over very, very quickly because now it, like the United States, the international community, basically forgetting what happened on October 7th, forgetting that there are still hostages there. Here in Israel, you have uh, a hostage movement which is accusing the government of not doing everything that they can to bring back the hostages. Um, so I, I think this, this issue of the hostages needs to be brought back front and center because that's that's the justification. That's the reason why this war is being fought to begin with. So someone else who at this point is also has also perhaps forgotten why Israel did what it had to do after October the 7th is Representative Nancy Pelosi, former House Speaker and ally of Joe Biden. She signed a letter on Friday along with other uh, congressional Democrats, dozens of them, to the president and to Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, urging a halt in weapons transfers to Israel. And that is just, you know, above and beyond, beyond you know, beyond what anything uh, you know, you can talk about humanitarian aid, but to actually say no more transfers of arms to Israel, I mean, that, that's above and beyond the pale, in my opinion. Well, there's two things that you see over here. Number one is that uh, the, the whole the whole doctrine of the U.S.-Israel uh, relationship as it regards to military is that Israel should always have a qualitative military edge over the other countries in the Middle East. This has been said over and over and over again by Democrats, by Republicans, by administrations. Um, if Nancy Pelosi is now saying that uh, that she would urge a halt to weapons transfers, that means the end of that doctrine, where the United States no longer is committed to Israel having a qualitative military edge over over its neighbors because it's been using its weapons and, and it will need to replenish those weapons in order to maintain that qualitative military edge. The second thing that I think it, we're seeing now uh, very clearly you know, we, we know that the, there is a progressive wing of the Democratic Party that is not pro-Israel. But there was this old guard of the Democratic Party. And who was that old guard led by? You know, by President Biden, by Chuck Schumer, who last week, uh, you know, called for an Israeli election. Uh, and by Nancy Pelosi, who former Speaker of, of the House, and some others. But now what you're seeing is that this old guard which supported Israel true and through for, for decades because they've been through previous conflicts uh, that, that Israel has has gone through, 1967 war, you know, 1973 Yom Kippur war. They're turning on Israel too. Uh, and, and so there's a big question about uh, you know whether there's really going to be any support left for Israel inside the Democratic Party, save for a few pro-Israel Democrats like Richie Torres or, or Brad Sherman. Uh, but this old guard leadership is now also turning the way the younger progressive guard has already turned. Yeah, it looks like more and more are joining the so-called squad, which is very unfortunate when it comes to bipartisan support for Israel, uh, as you mentioned. And you also talked about Iran. And if it was any other Newsweek, this would probably be the top story that we'd discuss here on the program. But because of the six-month uh, 
I don't know if you want to call it an anniversary. It had six month marking since the beginning of the war, but you had a major strike by somebody. Israel's not taking credit for it, but everyone's pointing at Israel. A top Iranian commander was taken out in Damascus uh, last week, along with, um, I don't know, half a dozen, if not more, other terrorists in that strike. Israel, of course, not taking, again, not taking credit, but Iran publicly vowing re- uh, revenge against the state of Israel. You even had the uh, the Ayatollah there, um, supreme leader of Iran, say Khamenei, on, yeah. Khamenei, yeah, saying on Twitter Khamenei, yeah. X that he was going to his nation was going to strike again, uh, strike against Israel any day now, and we regret uh, taking that action. You had Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz warning also on X that Israel would respond in kind should Iran launch a direct attack against us, and he actually uh, he actually. Um, Put the uh, at symbol there on Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei in his post there, sending a, a message directly to the top. Do not mess with Israel. Do not attack us. You will pay the price. Well, he, Katz said that uh, if if Iran launches a strike from its own territory on Israel, uh, that Israel would launch a direct strike on Iran. So that is a threat to very uh, much escalate the war. Israel's been operating against Iranian proxies since October 7th, and and people forget and they think that this is just an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel's been fighting simultaneously and been attacked simultaneously by Hamas, by Hezbollah, by the Houthis, by Kata'ib, Hezbollah in, in Syria. These are all Iranian proxies that are working together as an axis of terror around the state of Israel, and Israel has been responding in kind, attacking the various proxies. We see what they're doing in Gaza. We've talked many times previously on episodes of Jerusalem Minute about what's going on in Lebanon against Hezbollah. We've talked about the Houthis attacking. Um, Israel's been striking regularly inside Syria as well. They seem to have upped the ante by striking what is believed to be an Iranian consulate, just uh, outside of Damascus, near Damascus, uh, taking out, like you said, seven uh, brigadier generals of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, including uh, Zahidi, who basically, they say, took over for for Qasem Soleimani. Uh, So he was really one of Iran's uh, top generals. Um, And Iran is basically threatening uh, with a lot of bluster that uh, they could send the entire region into war. But sometimes when you have a lot of bluster, that is exactly when you don't have a lot of action. Um, and we'll have to see what happens. Iran has said that every Israeli Israeli embassy or consulate around the world is now at risk. Um, we have to see if Iran would strike. But certainly on the home front, there's been preparations that are being made for a larger war. The Pikuda Oref, the, the National Home Front uh, Command. Home Front Command has been uh, sending instructions to people to prepare food. Uh, to make sure that they have batteries and radios and and other things like that. Um, And they've been sending instructions to the nursery schools, telling them make sure you have enough water and that the the, um, safe rooms are cleared out in case uh, people have to go in and be in for extended periods of time. So, you know, these escalations can, can get serious very, very quickly. It seems like a lot of bluster. We don't know if that bluster is going to turn into action. I remember at the beginning of the war, they were, there were similar threats and people were stocking up on water. You couldn't find bottled water on the shelves at the, at the very, very beginning, uh, fearing a th- the possible Hezbollah major strike. So we'll see what happens here. But, of course, you know, the U.N. Security Council discussed uh, condemning Israel, even though Israel didn't take credit for it, for killing terrorists somehow. It just shows you how crazy the world is right now. But... That resolution uh, did not pass. It was introduced by uh, the Russians. They drafted it. And you have the U.S., Britain, and France saying, I guess, even for those countries, that that was too much. And they weren't going to let that uh, anti-Israel resolution uh, pass when, again, Israel didn't take credit. But it looks like uh, Israel was responsible for that strike. Uh, Iran, at the same time, is trying to arm, uh, set a fire, really, uh, all of Judea and Samaria. There are reports here that um, the uh, from the IDF who are fighting Hamas in, in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria, they're saying the Iranian regime continues to foment violence, uh, flooding the area with weapons, according to a report in the New York Times the other day, citing officials in Washington, Jerusalem, and in Tehran. So not only are they threatening perhaps some sort of massive strike, whether it's Hezbollah, one of their proxies, or directly from Iran, but they're also arming... 
the Arabs in Judea and Samaria, whether it's Hamas-affiliated, PIJ, perhaps Fatah, providing weapons so they can continue to carry out these attacks. And we've seen a, a sharp rise in attacks, especially here in Ramadan, a murderous attacks in different places throughout Israel, not just in Judea and Samaria, but in places like Ganyavna and Beersheba and whatnot. But Iran, again, using one of their tentacles on another front, trying to uh, try to kill more and more Jews, really. Yeah, they they have been um, they have been transferring weapons, you know, from Iran across Iraq through Syria into Lebanon into Jordan. From Jordan, they get into Judea and Samaria, and uh, we have seen just the proliferation of weapons and and machine guns, uh, whether those are Kalashnikovs or M16s, uh, you know, inside Judea and Samaria. A lot of the attacks now that are taking place in Judea and Samaria are shooting attacks. Uh, which is different than what we saw about 10 years ago when we were dealing with stabbings and car rammings and obviously knives and cars are, are very dangerous weapons if they're used accordingly. But uh, machine guns can kill many, many more people uh, in a short period of time. And, and we see that happening. And yes, Iran has been trying to destabilize Israel from every side. What, you know, if it's the Houthis in Yemen, if it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, if it's Hamas in Gaza, uh, and now inside Judea and Samaria itself. But this is a strategy that's been taking place for decades, and it begs the question as to why on earth would the United States and other Western countries uh, try to provide funding to Iran? Uh, and, and not only are they destabilizing the Middle East through conventional weapons and ballistic missiles, but of course they are also using every ounce of funding that they have available to develop nuclear weapons. And if Iran was already a nuclear power, uh, you know, th- that would change the, the face of the entire region. So you know, the, a lot of what's going on today, and, and I, I think this is also something that Israel should be discussing uh, much more openly, is a result of the faulty policies of the United States uh, and Western countries to provide sustenance and, and breathing room and funding to Iran, which is just taking that money and destabilizing the entire Middle East. This is the Middle East, folks. This is not the U.S.-Canadian border, and appeasement does not work here. Strength is what rules here in the Middle East. If you show weakness, that's when your enemies strike, when you appease people like uh, countries like Iran, nations like Iran, with money, and you relieve them of sanctions. They take every opportunity, and that's why— we had October the 7th. You could make an argument for that, and that certainly is what uh, President uh, Trump did in an interview with Israel Hayom. It happened, I think, uh, about 10 days ago or so, more or less, and um, he, said, he said a lot of things about Israel, about Jews in America or whatnot. Um, he defended Israel's right to respond on October the 7th in this exclusive interview, and he directly blamed Joe Biden for the war in Israel. We actually have a video clip of uh, that interview in Israel. Let's roll the tape. If they respected our president, which they don't, they have no respect for him whatsoever, that attack would not have happened. That's why it wouldn't have happened with me. But I say just be strong, be smart, and uh, let's get this over with. And when it's over with, you're going to be back to having a great life. So again, in addition to putting the blame on the weakness of the Biden administration, saying basically that under his rule, October 7th would never happened. He also expressed disappointment with Jews who do not support him. He actually said that they hate Israel. Jews who vote for the Democratic Party in the U.S., they hate Israel, and he just doesn't get it. What's your take on the uh, Trump interview? I think that there were two things that he said that are particularly noteworthy. The first is that he has said that uh, this war should be ended quickly, you know, that uh, it's taking too long. Um, And I think that he's right, but I think that he's putting the blame in the wrong place. I think that if the the Biden administration has been slowing down uh, this war, and obviously it's been for many decades, Israel's security doctrine to win wars conclusively and to win wars quickly. Time is never on the IDF side. They have to operate quickly. but the blame should be placed on the Biden administration. If, if Trump was in office, perhaps he would have given Israel a green light to do what you have to do and get done as quickly as possible. And he would not have taken steps to slow Israel down in its tracks. Um, the other thing that he said was that, uh, you know, that this is a PR disaster for Israel and Israel shouldn't have been sending photos of it bombing buildings, you know, out to right. the, the public. I, look, I, again, I think that there there's reasons why. 
Uh, this is a PR disaster for Israel. I think Israel is probably doing as well as it's ever done in, in its history to be explaining what it's doing, when and why, uh, bringing forward information, explaining their policies better than ever before. In, in regards to withholding pictures and videos, there's cameramen and journalists and citizen journalists and people who have cell phones inside Gaza. And Al Jazeera is there, Reuters is there, others are inside Gaza. So pictures are going to get out. <laughs> We're in the age of 24-7 internet and social media, and there's no way of, of keeping pictures of what's taking place out of the, the mainstream media. So I think that Israel had no choice you know, but to be showing what they're doing, what they're accomplishing, how they're doing it. Those photos also make it more likely that you're going to get a fast victory. When Hamas and and the Gazans see you know just how much damage Israel is doing, and that the IDF is able to be so p- precise with their attacks, that would lead to a faster victory, not a slower victory. At the same time, also that the United States could be providing a lot of PR cover for Israel, and they're not doing that. Instead of attacking Israel's prime minister, if the United States, if Western powers were saying that everything that's happening inside Gaza now is a result of Hamas's attack on October 7th and killing 1,200 people and the taking of hostages, and we support everything that Israel is doing to defeat Hamas. If if that was the talking points, Israel would be doing a lot better in the PR battle, but that's not what's happening. The United States could be providing cover to the United States in the PR, in the public opinion, in the diplomacy battle, and, and they're pulling that support back and making it much, much more difficult for Israel, which is also makes it another reason why Israel's got to finish this war as fast as possible. No doubt about that. And as all this is going on, the Palestinian Authority taking advantage uh, or trying to take advantage of the situation, uh, they, I believe we brought it up uh, last week briefly, they are now moving forward with this bid for full UN membership status. At this point, it's now stuck in committee. The U.S. actually saying that they do not believe that the world should unilaterally recognize a so-called Palestinian state. And they think it has to be a result of a discussion between all the parties. You know, me personally, I'm completely against any sort of Palestinian state, especially after October the 7th. Didn't take October the 7th to convince me, but after October the 7th to reward them with the state at this juncture, would I think would be insane, uh, or at any juncture really, but especially now. But they're moving forward. It's now kind of stuck in committee. But they are trying not only through terrorist attacks, uh, through war, through violence, through threats, but they're also trying through diplomacy, trying to get this recognition, in my opinion, a two-state solution, an existential threat to the state of Israel and should never uh, never come to be. Yeah, really important to just go back and remember that Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip in 2005 and created the pilot project for the independent Palestinian entity. October 7th was the result, the direct result of that pullout. It took 18 years, but it wasn't the first attack. Israel has been attacked numerous times over and over again with tens of thousands of rockets. It wasn't the first kidnapping that took place. There have been many kidnapping attempts and, and hostage attempts, taking attempts. The, the tunnels were not a new phenomenon. They, being, they were being built for years. October 7th was the result of giving Palestinians complete autonomy without Israeli military control over that territory. And if there would be a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, you can look at Gaza and know what a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria ultimately will look like. And if you think that Gaza is just one example and maybe there's other examples, well, look at Syria, look at Lebanon, you know, look at other countries that are that are there um, because you don't have leaders in the Palestinian Authority like you have in the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia that are talking about moderation and, and acceptance of peoples that are looking to normalize relations with the state of Israel, you have Palestinian leaders that continue to incite the violence, continuously uh, fund terrorism with their pay for slave program, where they're basically paying salaries to terrorists that get caught in, in the act of committing first degree murder or, or sending stipends for life to their families of those that got killed in the act of committing first degree murder. So the idea that a Palestinian state would be the result of October 7th uh, you know, that that that's an idea that, that should send shockwaves through every Israeli uh, and does. Um, right now, the United States is saying that they will uh, veto a resolution. But if you look at the trajectory, what's taking place with regard to U.S. support, the U.S. continues to say 
that they think the only outcome to this conflict is a two-state solution. I, I think that there's good reason to believe that they are threatening Israel, that if Israel does not do what they think you know, should be happening in this war, that at some point uh, in the not too distant future, that they may not veto uh, such a resolution. And this could very well be the path uh, towards Palestinian statehood that uh, Israel has been trying to avoid for so many years. Yeah, talk is certainly cheap. We saw the United States abstain on the last vote at the UN Security Council, an anti-Israel resolution. Who knows if they'll do the same again in the future. But switching gears here, Alex, I'm sure you've heard by now of the Iron Dome defense system. I'm sure most of you out there have heard of the Iron Dome. But did you know there is something called the Sea Dome air defense system? It's spelled the letter C, Dome. Did you hear any? I, this is the first I've ever heard of such a system. Well, it's basically the Iron Dome on ships, okay? That's why it's a C, like a... Uh but it's spelled with a C, not S E A, but they merely mean C S E A. And it was only it was only last week actually that the that there was a drone that was sent that believe it from came from Iraq uh, that actually struck a naval base off the coast of Elat, barely missing a, a seafaring naval vessel um, in Elat. So there's a need for for greater air defense there. Uh, certainly, the Houthis have already been firing ballistic and cruise missiles at. Israel and the missile defense is a, is a key component of defending the home front here. And as uh, this war has been going on, Israel has been already testing not only Iron Dome and the Sea Dome, but has also been testing a laser system, uh, which would be able to essentially do the same thing that Iron Dome could do, but without needing to reload uh, these missile defense missiles, basically, um, that cost a lot of money that have to be manually loaded into the, into the machines. It's not like an automatic system. It's it's somewhat semi-automatic. Um, the laser would be able to shoot things out of the sky in just rapid fire succession and wouldn't cost much money to operate this system once it, once it, is, once it is built. Um, so missile defense, extremely important. Um, it, it not only saves Israeli lives, it also saves Palestinian lives and Lebanese lives because if Israel wasn't able to shoot these things out of the sky, they'd have no choice but to go on to a much harsher counteroffensive. Yeah, I mean, by the time we record next week, who knows, based on the directives there by the uh, by Homeland uh, Security and um, and, uh, you know, we'll have to see if we have, in fact, have to use the Sea Dome, the Iron Dome, David Sling, the lasers, who knows what. Uh, lies ahead in the uh, in the in the week ahead from what we're hearing now how Iran chooses to strike if it's here if it's abroad if it's here you know we might uh, we might need those shelters we might need all the sea domes we can get and iron domes and David sling and lasers and arrows and all the other stuff the new cycle our, uh, the new cycle is moving so quickly yeah, right absolutely. now threats from every side military diplomatic and also remember that this war was launched on the Jewish festival of Sukkot. Right now, we have just gotten through the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Somehow, we we managed to, to escape that without uh, too much damage. Not that it was a peaceful month; it certainly wasn't. Certainly but, not. But there was there was threats that things could have gotten much worse during this month, and it looks like somehow or another we've gotten to the end of it. Uh, but it, it, we're we're now at the beginning of the Hebrew month of Nisan. Uh, and in two weeks' time, the other major week-long Jewish festival of Passover will begin. Um, and if we look at what happened on the last week-long festival just six months ago on, on Sukkot, um, we don't know what might be in store on Passover. Yeah, let's hope for a quiet Passover. Just one last thing, by the way. I just want to let you know I was in Jerusalem over Shabbat this past week, one of the popular hotels, if you will, uh, in downtown Jerusalem, and uh, several people came up to me and said that they enjoy watching Jerusalem Minute on JNS TV. So I was very appreciative. I mean, it was a it was a good feeling. Well, you're doing a great job. <laughs> so are you. And that's uh, that's gonna do it for this week here. Jerusalem Minute on JNS TV. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you log on to JNS.org to get all of the news. It as Alex said before, it happens very very fast right now. So. Go to JNS.org, go to JNS TV on YouTube, check out all the amazing programs, quality television content that uh, you're basically, you're just not getting anywhere else. Um, big shout out to Ryan Lifshitz, who does everything behind the scenes here at the JNS studio. 
Everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Have a great week. Let's hope for peace. Let's hope for quiet. Let's hope for total victory over Hamas, return of the hostages. Continue to pray for the brave men and women of the IDF defending our country. Have a great week, everybody.